any other thought like peace-filled patience is rejected as unreasonable and unrealistic. What I want to talk to us for a few minutes now about today has to do with um, peace in our lives and peace in the waiting. Uh, we live in an instantaneous society and we have grown to get used to wanting things to happen instantly. But the fact of the matter is, is that everything is a process. Every single thing in life is a process. Everything and single thing in life requires a waiting period, yes? Yep, are you with me? Yeah. There's the thing. No one can bring you peace but yourself. No one can bring you peace but yourself. Yeah, but Pastor Gary, I believe all peace is given by God's grace. Correct. God is the peace giver. But we are the peace bringers. We are the peace activators in our own life. What God grants us freely, he does not force us to receive. Yeah? We allow and activate what he freely gives for us. We allow it and we activate it to have a manifestation in our lives. It is sovereign grace. But the fact of the matter is, is that God's sovereignty does not overrule, Therese, our sovereignty. What do you mean our sovereignty? Well, we don't call it our sovereignty. We call it free will. But our free will is man's sovereignty that God gave him. Therefore, whatever God gives to us, he does not make us receive. It's our grace gift on hold for us to unwrap. It's our grace gift right there closer than you can believe, closer than you can imagine, closer than maybe your negative circumstances have distanced it in feeling from you. But his grace gift of peace and every other gift that he gives us is grace given, but it is us activated because we are sovereign in this partnership along with God's sovereignty. His sovereignty is that he gave us sovereignty, calling it free will. Are you still with me? The weakness for most Christians is that they are more engaged with the affairs of this earth and society than they are intentionally engaged with the life of God's kingdom within themselves. And that's so good that I'm going to repeat it. The weakness for most Christians is this. We're more engaged with the affairs of this earth and society consciously than we are intentionally engaged with the life of God's kingdom that is within us. Now listen closely. God's promises require our engagement. God's promises require our active and intentional engagement. And probably what we've talked about in the previous weeks is that we have to come to the realization that he's already given us permission to engage them. But we've begun to be so distanced by what God has already permitted us to receive, we've become so society-oriented, we've become so externally oriented with what is reality in life, 
that we haven't engaged with that which is actual reality at the spirit core root of our being. So today's topic is learning the art of peace-filled waiting. You see, since we all know or should realize that life in large part is about waiting either for short periods of time or sometimes extended periods of time, waiting is part of the game. Waiting is part of the natural life process. As a matter of fact, God said that with faith and patience, i.e. waiting, we inherit his kingdom. You see, we're living in increasingly anxious times. Our American society is based on speed. Getting things done more and more quickly and easily. Yes? It's been dubbed a microwave, a microwave society. That's what all of our commercial, uh, commercials are based on, is getting things done quickly and easily and with greater efficiency so that we can have great, more time off to enjoy life, except that the statistics have proven we are more stressed out today and we are enjoying our time off less because we've really gotten away from the essentials of life. It's so much so that wait has become a four-letter word. We've got a few four-letter words. In the winter season, it's snow. <laughs> but wait has become a four-letter word to us. Now, when we look at many of the Bible stories and even third world cultures of today, Bill, uh, we often have feelings of gratitude that we aren't living in and God didn't destine us to live in those backward countries. Yeah? That we're privileged to live in our culture rather than those primitive ones. Yeah. But I repeat, to good Americans, wait is a four-letter word that describes inferior, unrealistic American living to us. That's why it's so good to live here, because we've got so many advantages, because we've got so much technologies, because we've got so many things that make ha things happen so quick, we don't have to wait. And therefore, we have developed into some of mo the most immature people on the face of the earth. Did, how many of you know that it takes waiting to develop maturity? The challenge, the fruit of not knowing the art of peace-filled waiting is causing and is the cause of more disease and suffering than any other single cause today. And that is medically proven. Here's the good news, though. You do want some... <laughs> when do we get into the good news, Pastor Gary? Here's the good news for anyone that has ears to hear. Do you notice how many times Jesus said that? For those that have ears to hear, you know, we, we develop so many mindsets in our religion, in religiosity, in our churchianity, that we have become dull to actually hear. But for those who have ears to hear we can discover the joy and productivity of peace-filled waiting. Now when I make a proclamation like that, I oftentimes see people's eyes glaze over, like Kenneth Hagin used to say, like a calf at a new gate. Why is that? It seems like such good news. But people are so used to believing that having to wait is like a game of let's jam another stick in my eye. It's hard to believe we can expect waiting and patience to marry and birth peaceful, successful children. Are you with me? Therefore, if the consensus of thinking is that the patience of waiting is pain-filled struggle, 
to the point of even making jokes about it, like, don't pray for patience, brother. <laughs> and we laugh, <laughs> yeah, don't ever pray for patience. Any other thought, like peace-filled patience, is rejected as unreasonable and unrealistic. But the, new, the, the really, really, really good news is this. Are you still with me? Are, are, we're on the same pond. We're ducks on the same pond. Okay, the good news is peace-filled patience as a fruit of the Spirit is possible for every one of us. Now, here is the deal. Here's the, here's the caveat to that. The process of unlearning destructive patterns isn't easy because it's very well ingrained within us. But it's not the dabblers with truth the change because the change is well worth it the transformation in our minds the renewal being transformed by the renewing of our minds is well worth it but it's not comfortable we talked about it a, lot, a couple of weeks ago we go through this thing psychologists call cognitive dissonance that means what we've rigidly always believed whenever we hear anything that seems like it is opposing that it goes on the inside but yet, if you actually are committed to the fact that you want to hear the truth no matter who says it, no matter where it comes from, no matter where God leads, no matter where it's revealed from, the Holy Spirit has a way because he hears your heart and he ends up, even though sometimes it feels like you go through a meat grinder, I mean, I'm maybe I'm only talking about myself, but as if I've had to develop in the area of expanding that truth in my life that has brought, I mean to tell you, huge changes in the area of peace and joy and a sense of stability, going through that was not fun. But it was well worth it. And I'm still going through it. But I, ha I, dis I discovered, Bill, that the thing is, I dabbled for years. One of the things I dabbled with for years, and I'm not going to go off on a tangent here, I'm just going to mention it, but I dabbled with meditation for years. I dabbled with Mark Verkler's yes. journaling, and so I dabbled with it. You know, it never worked. I mean, I, I could ever kind of make it work. And, but as soon as I decided that I was going to become committed to it, and also realizing there is not one right size that fits all, there's all different kinds of ways to silence and slow down your monkey brain, to bring it into a place where the Holy Spirit can be heard, because the monkey brain is making so much noise, you can't hear the still, small whisper. So how do you change that? God does not make that change. We exercise our own sovereignty and do something that some men say isn't manly. It's not manly to meditate. I don't meditate, that's not manly. That's a chick thing. Hope you enjoy your bologna sandwich. <laughs> so let me quickly add again, there's lots and lots and lots of ways to bring about the process. There isn't just one right way to do it, okay? But finding ways, and I would say multiple ways because you get tired of one way all the time, at least I do, multiple ways of bringing your monkey thoughts into submission to allowing yourself to be silent and quiet in the depths of your being is more than worth because it's the song we sang today this is the air I breathe the, my mind automatically went to the fact that there's that anywhere from 15 minutes to a half hour or so in the morning Although God speaks to me, and I hear, and I talk to him all day long, but the air I breathe and the revelation that has been life transforming to me has come to me in the silent time. 
that I learned to not dabble with but commit myself to whether or not anything seemed to happen on one day or not. But being committed to the process. 1 Corinthians 2.16 is we have the mind of Christ. Ephesians 2.6, we are seated with Christ and have the ability to see from a heavenly perspective. It's good to think about maybe exercising that. Number three, 2 Corinthians 5.17, if anyone be in Christ, they are new creations. Old things have passed away and behold, that's a good word, apparently he's drawing attention to this. Behold, new things have come. The word that is used new in new things have come is our English word prototype. Uh, what is a prototype? A prototype is something that's brand new that is co totally different than everything else around you. You yourself within, your spirit is a prototype. Among prototypes in followers of Christ. So therefore, it's understandable why Paul would say, don't be pressed into the world's mold. You're a prototype. You're seated with Christ in heavenly places. You have the mind of Christ. Why are you so occupied with society and things going on in society around you? Well, we live here, brother. This is the place we live in. No, I happen to live and dwell with Christ, with the mind of Christ in heavenly places, and I'm just visiting this society. Oh, okay, you're more spiritual than I am, you think. Oh, come on. No, I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that. I maybe one at, at one time I may have said that. But now see, it's it's very difficult. You can have arguments to argue people out of things. But you can't Talk somebody out of an experience that they've had. The most powerful thing you can have are experiences with the Lord. We change not by academic beliefs. We change by spiritual experiences. Our problem is that religion has taken the place of revelation. Isaiah chapter 40 verses 29 to 31 very powerful verses verse 29 says the Lord gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak you know Gary we need to come to a place where we're not constantly saying I am so weak I'm so weak I'm so weak we get attacked with feelings of weakness. That's not the same thing as being weak. And that's an important difference. Did you know that God gave us a central nervous system? This is the science of it. God gave us a central nervous system that obeys our speech center. If we say it long enough, now this is not just happened with one time, but if we say it long enough from a place where we believe it, that's the placebo kind of thing. If we say it long enough, I am weak, the central nervous system submits to that and we become physically and emotionally weak. That's science that is not an enemy of faith. The Lord gives strength all right, I'm feeling the feeling of feeling weak right now, but bless God, he gives me strength. Hallelujah. Now, you don't have to exclaim it like that. But on the inside, quietly, like my wife has got a much more tame personality than I do. So she wouldn't go, yes, glory to God, bless God, amen. He gives me strength. <laughs> But she can say it with a belief that is just as strong, and she does on the inside. I feel weak. I feel the feelings of being weak. But praise God, I am strong in the strength of the Lord because he gives me strength. And the fire comes out of the eyes of her spirit. The Lord gives strength to the weary, increases the power of the weak. 
So if you're, you know, Lorraine, if you're feeling the feeling of, I'm just tired. Well, number one, you know everybody's really, really tired right now. That we are in such a different situation in the world and in our country. There have been so many unnatural things that we're not used to put upon us restriction, restrictively. Everybody is tired. I heard somebody say one time that the fact of the matter is is not that everybody that seems like they're rebelling are not rebelling. They're just tired. But here we got a verse. The Lord gives strength to the weary. But here's the deal. If we know that, then we go, well, wait a minute. I'm weary, but the Lord gives strength to the weary. Lord, I'm calling on that now. I'm believing you for that. I'm thanking you for that. The Lord gives strength to the weary. Don't play into your side, your tribe's conspiracy theory. <laughs> go with the kingdom of God and be concerned about what he has to say about the whole thing. And you're weary, but the Lord gives strength to the weary. And he increases the power of the weak. And verse 30, even youths grow tired and weary and young men stumble and fall. It's just not the old guys and the old ladies. Even youths grow tired and weary. But those who wait, and it can also be translated hope, those who wait on the Lord will renew their strength. But you know the word on there in the... Uh, NIV translation, I really like, it's a good one because it's closer than on, instead of waiting on the Lord. Waiting on the Lord has the idea of waiting on him to do something. I'm waiting on the Lord to do something. But waiting in the Lord, huh, those who wait in the Lord will renew their strength. Now, let me magnify that just a little bit with uh, one of those quiet times that actually the truth of the matter is I start my time of silence before I get out of bed and that I just simply extend it into another period of intentional meditation technique that I happen to be on at that particular time. Variety is the spice of life it's also the spice of meditation. I had these words come to me that began the psalm that I wrote after I got up but I had partially written before I got up and it was it was opening up something it was there was a revelation taking place and it was through that little word in a revelation was taking place in me how then the extension of that is how you can have peace filled waiting and I use the word within because I heard it as in to begin with, but within was a better understanding of what was included in the word in. Waiting within your love. There is a joy and there is peace. Waiting within your love, this is where I choose to be. Waiting within your love, there is grace throughout my day. Waiting within your love, this is where I learn to stay. Within his love there is solution and fresh wisdom for each hour. It's his love that makes me stronger with his joy and saving power. Waiting within. Directing your imagination to feel the feeling of being surrounded by and immersed within his bottomless cup of unconditional love. And so when I'm in a situation, I'm having to wait for the manifestation, I begin to intentionally surround myself with the gratitude and the emotion that I am enriched by his unconditional love. And now I'm within that love. And because what I know about love, that any human being that loves can teach you, you don't need the Bible to tell you what love feels like. We know it from human experience. What we feel 
in genuine love in human experience is actually a manifestation of God's love taking place. Even when an atheist is genuinely loving somebody, they are manifesting God. Are you still with me? And so therefore, I can begin to immerse myself in the sense that even though I am waiting, the peace begins to come upon me, I tell you, by experience, not by some more theology and doctrinal teaching that this is the way you believe if you're part of our herd. I experience the peace that begins to arise because I'm waiting all right, but it's okay because in the waiting, I'm in the pool of his manifest love where nothing is too good for me and it will not stretch out any longer than it needs to be because all along the way, his love is keeping me. Yep. Psalm 34, 8, O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. Oh, taste and see. You know, so much of the promise of the Lord, so much of his communication with his children is really on an emotional, tactile level and not just an academic theory, doctrinal level. Oh, taste and see. Taste it. As a matter of fact, the Hebrews used to do this, Bill. When they were teaching a young class the scriptures and they were teaching that verse, the very first thing they would do is the, the teacher would come around and put a dab of honey on the top of the slate that they were going to be writing on and he would tell them to lick it. And then when they licked it and taste that sweetness, then they would teach them, oh, taste and see that God is as good as the honey is sweet. Oh, taste, understand by the taste of flavor. In other words, perceive by imagining flavor, imagining being surrounded by that love, the intense love. Maybe that's an area that somebody one of y'all, the first thing is maybe the prayer is Holy Spirit. My perception of love is sh fractured. I need you to repair that, please. I need you to repair that, please. I receive everything, but where I need healing as much as anywhere is I need healing in my fractured perspective perception of what love is because I'm having trouble even feeling the feeling of what is love unconditionally really feel like. I mean, in fact, maybe that's a prayer that's really good for all of us to pray. Lord, heal my love perception. It's become so distorted. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Now, this is a wonderful, wonderful word. This is not good like chocolate. This is not good like a Snickers or Hershey bar. The Hebrew meaning of the word love is entirely different and much more expansive because when it talks about good, it, that's the way God is described. That he's good. Well, he's better. He's not, he's not good like a Hershey bar. He must be a whole lot better than that, much more flavorful. But the word that's translated good is also used in other ways throughout the scriptures. And the other ways are happy, joyful, for the Lord is happy, for the Lord is joyful, for the Lord is beautiful, for the Lord is kind, for the Lord is loving, for the Lord is without flaw. Oh, taste, taste by experience by imagining, by feeling the feeling of <laughs> that he is happy. That's one that's religion's really distorted. God's not a happy God. God's more ticked off because of our disobedience than anything else. Huh. That's religion, man. 
That's not the truth. God is happy. He is joyful. He is filled with joy. As a matter of fact, it said about Jesus, who was a demonstration of the Father, that he was more joyful by the anointing of the Holy Spirit than any of his brothers. And he was the patterned son, brothers and sisters. That wasn't just reserved for him. But you know, I've told you this a few times before, bears repeating. The word that in that same verse says that Jesus, in the old English, he eschewed evil. It literally means he rejected murmuring. It doesn't mean he just rejected people that mixed, swam, and smoked, and did anything that's on your list of sins. It means that he hated evil. It didn't mean that he hates whatever political party you don't like, or the people in it, or whatever. That's not what it means. It can include that, but a broader idea of it, that Jesus refused to get caught in the trap of going around and murmuring about how bad life was because they did this and they did that and look how bad they are and look how bad that is. It said he hated that and because he hated that he was able to receive the anointing of the Holy Spirit that had made him more joyful than all of his brothers. So if we want to taste the same joy that Jesus tasted that was not his exclusive property then maybe that's one principle that we need to abide by and stop looking at and, and, and murmuring and complaining and backbiting and blaming everybody else for everything and you'd have peace and you'd have joy if only they. Here's a saying to remember. Maybe you've already heard it. It's a reflection of the story of David and Goliath. Two rules. Rule number one. Don't sweat the small stuff. Rule number two. With God it's all small stuff. The peace of a quieted mind is the throne room of God-given wisdom. Praise the Lord. As a benediction, let's just pray this together. Just receive this. May his word and wisdom find root in our hearts and minds today. And may we discover his spirit as our supernatural help. May we each progress beyond dabbling with the truth to committing to it. In Jesus' name.